I want to thank the committee uh, for organizing this event. It's an honor to be here among friends and colleagues um, as a sociologist. Humans are embedded in social networks. And these networks obey very particular mathematical, biological, and social principles. And given this reality, we can use an understanding of social network structure and function to intervene in networks, whether online or face-to-face, -to, -face, to benefit humanity. Now, beginning in the 1950s, many studies evaluated the diffusion of innovations, such as medicines, cars, herbicides, or seeds, within groups, often with adoption curves, such as shown in the upper right, uh, in a, from a classic book from the 1960s. But they did not map networks through which these innovations had spread. Yet ideas regarding how to do so had existed as early as 1934, when Austrian-American psychiatrist Jacob Marino produced this image, shown on the lower right, showing 11 members of a fraternity and whom they personally identified as their particular friends. Drawing pictures of these mathematical objects and ascertaining the actual structure of social groups is a fundamental shift in perspective, a perspective that lies between individuals or dyads on the one hand and whole amorphous populations on the other. And this shift in perspective presented new puzzles and prompted new empirical questions. For example, we could ask, how and why are human populations naturally structured into social networks? How do social networks function to affect important outcomes, ranging from health, misinformation, violence, emotions, financial services, technology adoption, public goods production, and so on? How do non-obvious phenomena, such as obesity or altruism, spread via social contagion? How might social structure and social contagion transpiring within it, and not just individual characteristics, such as preferences or age or wealth or so on, help determine human welfare? And last, what are properties of social networks that emerge and that can transcend the individuals or dyads within them? Now today I'm going to focus on social contagion, namely the process whereby changes in behavior or knowledge in one individual spread over their connections within a defined network to other individuals, including those to whom the original person is not directly tied. And to really study social contagion, we needed large graphs and temporal resolution. And this required new sorts of data, new methods, both in the field and online. And ultimately, it required experiments, all of which have appeared in the last 20 years. Now, my own work with social contagion began in the 1990s with studying the widowhood effect, or how illness or death in one spouse could spread and cause illness or death in the other spouse. But in the year 2001, I moved on to studying more complex networks. This observational study on the spread of obesity was published in 2007. And this paper wound up prompting many other substantive inquiries and methodologic advances by us and others. And it ultimately pushed me to do online experiments and large-scale field trials. Now, the prevalence of obesity had increased dramatically in the period after 1970. But to the extent that obesity is a product of personal choices and voluntary behaviors, the fact that people are embedded in social networks and are influenced by the appearance and behaviors of those around them, suggests that perhaps it should be possible to discern the way in which weight gain in one person might spread and cause or influence weight gain in other people, beyond just pairs of people, reflecting processes of social contagion. Now, my lab assembled a large, prospective, densely interconnected social network of 12,000 people. And these are real face-to-face -face interactions. And these people were repeatedly examined every four years, starting in 1971 until 2003. This image shows 2,200 people from this data set in the year 2000. Every dot is a person. Every line between them represents a relationship between two people. Who's whose friend? Who's whose sibling? Who's coworker? Who's neighbor? Who's spouse, for example? And we make the dot size proportional to people's body mass index. So bigger dots are bigger people. 
And we also color the dots purple if people are properly obese. If their body mass index is above 30, we color them purple. And if you look at this image, it should be apparent that there are clusters of obese and non-obese individuals. But the complexity is still very high, visually speaking. And in any case, several questions are raised by this clustering. First of all, how much clustering is there? Second, is there more clustering than due to chance? Third, how big are the clusters? And fourth, and perhaps most interestingly, what causes these clusters? So you can see these little clusters of purple and, and obese and non-purple, orange, non-obese individuals within the network. Well, we used a topological permutation test to assess this clustering, and here's what we found. On the, um, on the x-axis is the degrees of separation between the two people, and on the y-axis is the increase in probability that a person is obese, given that a social contact of theirs is obese. So what we find is that if your friends at one degree of separation are obese, you have a 45% higher likelihood of being obese yourself. And if your friends' friends at two degrees of separation are obese, you have a 25% higher likelihood. And if your friends' friends' friends uh, at three degrees of separation are obese, you have a 10% higher likelihood. And it's only when I get to your friends' 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 friends at four degrees of separation that there's no longer a relationship between that person's body size and your body size. So certainly we can see that there's more clustering than due to chance under a very simple null hypothesis. Because if it were chance, it would be flat across the board. There'd be no excess risk. Every step, every geodesic step through the network away from you, there'd be no excess risk that that person was obese uh, if you were obese. But furthermore, we also see that the clusters here extend to three degrees of separation. So the radius of the clusters is three degrees. And this intriguing empirical observation raises all sorts of questions and, propose, and sort of poses a number of puzzles including about the cause of the clustering. Now, at least three things uh, could explain this clustering. One idea is social contagion, or kind of social domino effect. Here, you know, your, your friends gain weight, it makes you gain weight, you gain weight, it makes the next person gain weight, and so on. The second possibility is homophily, or love of like, or birds of a feather flock together. Here, it's not that your weight gain caused your friend's weight gain, rather you formed a connection because you had a similar body size or similar taste in food or exercise to begin with. And the last possibility is that there's some kind of contextual effect. It's not neither of the foregoing, but rather that you are both jointly exposed to something like a gym that makes you lose weight, or a fast food joint that makes you gain weight at the same time. And indeed, all three of these are typically present in any social phenomenon. And it takes effort using diverse econometric approaches and ultimately experiments to tease them apart. And we ourselves introduced and used several statistical and conceptual approaches to identification with observ in observational data regarding networks. And we ultimately also devised various experimental paradigms to address these ch inferential challenges. Now the long longitudinality and precise temporal resolution of our data was helpful in identification. And we also used these data to make some of the very first social network videos that had been made. In this image here, the colors are as before. And, uh, and what's going to happen in this video is I'm going to take daily cuts through the network. Uh, and people are going to appear and disappear uh, as they are born and, uh, and die. Uh, connections are going to form and be disconnected. Uh, people are going to get bigger and smaller and change color as they gain or lose weight. And here we're now f watching the obesity epidemic unfold within this complex unfolding social network. That was just a 10 second clip speeded up from a much longer uh, period of time. And it's clear that a lot is going on. And obviously it's a very complicated object to analyze this real world phenomenon. But some, some insights can actually be gained by studying such a video, though the spread is hard to see visually and time is short today. And indeed, we used a variety of statistical approaches to assess social contagion given its complexity. Now, for instance, uh, the longitudinality in our data was especially helpful in tracing the role of homophily versus contagion because we were able to estimate how a change in obesity status uh, of an alter uh, was associated in a change in obesity status of an ego across time. 
and results from such models are shown here for different kinds of connections. The x-axis shows the percentage increase in an ego's risk of obesity if an alter becomes obese, and the y-axis indicates different kinds of social relationships. Now one of our statistical approaches that we also introduced uh, in the 2007 paper reflected a novel identification strategy, namely what we called the edge directionality test, which was very helpful in understanding the role um, of context. Now let me just uh, set the stage by asking you to uh, imagine that you have an ego and an alter, two individuals. I, the ego, might say you, the alter, are my friend. That would be an ego-perceived friend, which is at the top row. And you, the alter, might reciprocate the nomination. That would be a mutual friend. And last, you, the alter, might say I am your friend, but I might have no idea who you are. That would be an alter-perceived friendship. Now we would imagine that uh, if you gained weight, you, the alter, gained weight, you should have the biggest impact on me if it's a mutual friendship. And second, if it's an ego-perceived friendship, if I say you are my friend. And last, if at all, if it's an alter-perceived friendship. In an alter-perceived friendship, you say I am your friend, you're gaining weight, I might have no idea who you are, you might have or should have no influence on me. And actually this is very helpful because if there were some contextual factor that was making us both gain weight at the same time, it shouldn't respect these social relationships. The local fast food joint doesn't care if I say you are my friend or you say I'm your friend, we should both gain weight at the same time. So if we find the pattern that we do find, uh, it suggests that we can exclude context as a likely explanation for the association of your weight gain and my weight gain. And in fact, what we find is, is that if a mutual friend of yours gains weight in a particular time period, your risk of obesity goes up by, a sh by the amount shown there, and then second, your ego-perceived friend, and last, if at all, uh, the alter-perceived friend. And other sorts of social relationships like spouses and siblings and co-workers in small workplaces are also uh, shown on this slide. Now this, this uh, directionality test proved to be a novel idea and was explored uh, in further econometric work by other scientists. Some other findings regarding other, social, other sorts of social ties are also shown here, as I say, and taken together, these and other results in the paper supported a role for social contagion, in addition to the existence of homophily and context. Now, in the same 32-year period, from 1971 to 2003, that obesity increased, smoking declined dramatically in the United States and elsewhere around the world. We did a similar analysis for smoking and found similar hyperdyadic clustering and similar dyadic effects. But by the time we did that research in 2008, we had begun to conduct further sorts of analyses of more network-wide phenomena. For instance, look at the panel on the left. The x-axis is, uh, is time in roughly four-year intervals, and the y-axis measures the eigenvector centrality, or how central any given node is uh, within uh, the social network. And, uh, and what this does is, what, this, what that quantity does is it, it quantifies the geodesic location of people within a network and specifically how towards the center or periphery they are. And what we find is that the non-smokers re remain roughly similarly central over the whole 32-year period. But the smokers decline in the extent to which they are central within the network. Over time, the smokers find themselves on the social margins on the periphery of this network as, uh, as time goes by. Now the panel on the right shows something else. The x-axis is the same as the one I just talked about, and the y-axis plots the average size of smoker clusters within the network. So, uh, so this is the, the, if we look at how big the clusters are and we count how, on average, how big are the clusters of smokers, that's shown on the y-axis. And what we find is, is what we would expect to find if smoking were just declining at random through the social network, because overall smoking has declined in the population, we would expect the bottom blue dotted line here, which is that over time, as smokers willy-nilly were quitting, the size of the clusters of the smokers would go down. But that's not what we see. What we see is, is that the observed cluster size of the smokers stays roughly constant over 32 years. How can that be? 
how can the size of the clusters of the smokers stay the same even if the overall prevalence of smoking is declining with time? And the explanation is, is that whole interconnected groups of smokers were quitting together at once, like a, like a dro in droves, like a flock of birds changing direction, reflecting again a kind of network phenomenon, not just uh, an individual level uh, phenomenon. Given the difficulties with causal inference with such complex observational data, we started to perform experiments with social contagion very early on, creating networks of real people to study so as to test particular claims uh, growing from social contagion theory. Here is one very early experiment. In this experiment, college students were brought into the lab and they were randomly assigned to groups of four strangers with whom to play a public goods game with real money. Then a bell would ring and they'd be randomly assigned to new groups of people and then a bell would ring and they would be randomly assigned to new groups of people across multiple rounds. And we found that the effect of altruistic cooperation in this economic game could spread across people as highlighted in red. We found that if Eleni was kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas was kind to Erica in period two, Erica was kind to Jay in period three, and Jay was kind to Brecken in period four. And this is a very, to me, remarkable result because what it says is that how Jay treats Brecken depends on how Eleni treated Lucas even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever saw or interacted with Eleni or Lucas. And this can only be due to social contagion. It cannot be due to homophily or context because this is an experiment. We engineered the sequence of social interactions. And this geodesic spread via social contagion of kindness is distinct from the, highlighted in red, is distinct from the temporal persistence of the behavior which is highlighted um, in purple. Now here's another experiment of ours that evaluated the contagion of altruism in public goods games in more complex networks using bespoke software that we developed in my lab and made publicly available for doing such online experiments. We recruited over 1,400 subjects and we dropped them into 80 network groups and once again they played with real money. And we were interested in the, in the causes and the consequences of economic inequality and we wanted to approach the problem experimentally. We independently manipulated the initial inequality in these groups, setting the Gini to be 0 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, and separately, whether the immediate network neighbor's wealth was visible or not. Could the people in the game observe how much wealth each of their network neighbors had or not, thereby creating six treatment conditions in a 3 by 2 factorial design? For instance, one set of people were randomly put in the situation on the left, and they played a public goods game with their, with their new immediate network neighbors over 10 rounds uh, lasting uh, 30 minutes. So here you can see on the left, the, the, uh, the dot size is proportional to how rich people are. Bigger dots are richer people. Uh, and uh, at T0 is the first time step, and so people are randomly assigned to be rich or poor, big or small. The dotted nature of the lines indicates that it's the invisible condition. People can't see each other's wealth. And the Gini is set to 0 0.4, uh, shown on the bottom uh, left of the left-hand panel. Then they repeatedly play the game across time, not seeing each other's wealth. And they, at the end of the, the game, wind up at the, at the condition shown on the right-hand side of the left panel. Now we add colors. Blue indicates cooperators, people who are altruistic towards their neighbors, and red indicates defectors. And what you can see in that branch of the experiment is that all the dots get bigger, everyone gets richer, uh, most of the people are blue cooperators, and the inequality declines substantially from 0 0.4 to 0 0.14. On the right-hand side of the experiment, we now flip a switch, different people, and we make it possible so that people can see the wealth of their neighbors and we find none of the foregoing results. On the right-hand side, there's less uh, wealth production overall in this uh, artificial society of real people. There's greater inequality. The inequality persists. There are more defectors, more red dots than blue dots. Uh, and actually, there are fewer social connections uh, in the end as well. So in general, we found that invisibility decreased inequality. And in general, we found that inequality did not much affect cooperation, wealth production, 
or friendliness in these networks, but visibility did. And these findings are relevant to issues such as pay transparency in firms or to the benefits of school uniforms, which are a kind of invisibility cloak if you think about it. Now here is another entirely different paradigm of experiments we've also been conducting illustrating how one might manipulate contagion, for example, in sets of villages in the developing world, though the same principles could apply to sets of classrooms or workplaces or online and so on. Here are two networks of 105 people, and you can imagine targeting the six people shown on the right hand of village. So we've got two villages that we've mapped. On the right, we have randomly picked six purple dots, and you can imagine uh, targeting them, choosing them for a development economics intervention or a public health intervention of some kind. And the usual perspective in, in experiments of this kind is, is you come back a year later and you see, well, what fraction of those six people have adopted the practice? Maybe three of the six have adopted. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in response to treatment among the treated. I'm interested in response to treatment among the untreated. What does everyone else do in that village when you treat those six people. So maybe you treat those six and three of them adopt and they persuade or influence three of their friends via social contagion to adopt for a total say of six people in the right hand village and in the control village on the left maybe two people happen to adopt. And so you can do this experiment to test the existence of and the extent of social contagion. So a network perspective prompts a radical shift when it comes to interventions. We can become, as I said, interested not so much in the response to treatment among the treated, but in the response to treatment among the untreated. And this provides a very nice test uh, of social contagion. But once you begin thinking that way, you can ask yourself, could you accelerate or increase the spillovers for the whole village, say by targeting central people uh, who might be particularly structurally influential as quantified in various ways? For example, you might use eigenvector centrality and identify six people to target as shown here. You treat those six people with the public health or development economics intervention. Maybe, again, three of those six people adopt, but because of their structural position, they might influence 30 other members of the village to adopt. So same village, same intervention, uh, same number of people targeted, a substantially higher impact because of the thoughtful and shrewd way one might pe pick the targets uh, for intervention. And we can also experiment with different mathematically informed algorithms for picking such potentially influential nodes so as to enhance social contagion. But mapping a network is not always feasible. It can be expensive or impractical. So the question is, is there a targeting algorithm we can use to identify such influential individuals without having to map network ties for a whole population. Well, it turns out that there is a mathematical fact about social networks called the friendship paradox that is summarized in the observation that your friends have more friends than you do. The, the randomly chosen friends of randomly chosen people have on average higher degree and are more central and are possibly more capable of inducing greater spillover effects than the random people themselves. So you can pick the six purple dots at random, I ask them who their friends are, pick one of those friends at random, and go one step in the network to the orange dots, and those orange dots on average will have higher degree and be more central than the original purple dots as shown on this cartoon. But the reason this is key is that you can do the same thing without having to map the whole network. You can find the orange dots without having to ascertain the, uh, the network at all. Now let me give you a quick snapshot of a few of our large-scale randomized field trials in complex networks in various parts of the world. In our first field trial, starting in 2009, we mapped the networks of over 5,000 adults in each of 32 villages in Honduras. And we randomly assigned these whole villages to one of three different targeting algorithms. In one third of the villages, we picked 5% of the people at random to get a two week uh, uh, multivitamin and clean water intervention. In, in another third of the villages, we picked 5% of the people according to, who had, according to who had the highest degree. 
And in the final third of the villages, we pick 5% of the people using the friendship nomination uh, technique. And as I said, the design involved an educational intervention regarding multivitamins. And in addition to the educational intervention, we gave people coupons that they could redeem for multivitamins at the village store. And we also gave the original 5% seeds four coupons that they could pass along to their fellow villagers, perhaps with their endorsement or transmission of information about multivitamins that we had given them. Every coupon was uniquely numbered, and we tracked them as they were redeemed. And when people redeemed them, they were then given four new coupons that they could in turn pass on to still other individuals. And our questions were, how do we move a whole village and not just individuals to change their behavior? Who creates the most externalities for behavior change? Can we trace this through network ties? And how can we exploit this? Well, we did a number of analyses in this initial randomized controlled trial, but here's just one visualization to show how the friendship nomination targeting can enhance adoption compared to random targeting. And this Im image illustrates cascades of social contagion emanating from four exogenous seeds in two different villages. And the possible cascades up to day 15 are highlighted in gray, and the completed cascades have colors. So on the left-hand side, you can see, for example, uh, on the x-axis is time since initial targeting up to, say, 15 days. Uh, and then there are four initial nodes that are targeted. Uh, and the possible cascades are highlighted in gray. And you can see that many of the cascades are never completed. And that when the transmission events occur between people, which we can ascertain by the timing of the redemption of the coupons, the inter-individual spells are long. In a different village where we chose the original seeds using nomination targeting, a completely different result. Many more of the cascades are completed and the, the colored lines are shorter because the transmission is occurring faster. So part of the effect of friendship nomination targeting is fostering cascades to greater geodesic depth, as is apparent, but there is also more rapid transmission. Now here's the design of another very large scale field experiment that my group began in 2013. In this experiment, we mapped the social networks of 176 villages uh, in another part of Honduras in Copan. There were 30,802 people and we had an eight by two factorial design. Uh, different villages, 11 villages uh, in each of, of these 16 cells were assigned to eight different seed percentages. So 0% of the people in the village were given the intervention, 5%, 10%, 20%, 30 and so on. Uh, and then we had two different targeting methods. Was that percentage chosen at random or by the friendship nomination technique? And then the people selected to get the intervention were given a two-year maternal and child health intervention. And everyone in all the villages was ascertained for their outcomes repeatedly across 117 outcomes. And what we theorized would happen is shown in the middle panel. On the x-axis is the percentage targeted from 0 to 100%. And on the y-axis is the percentage of the people in the village adopting from 0 to 50%. And we capped that arbitrarily at 50 because we imagine that not, any, not every contagion could spread to everybody. There's an upper limit to how many people can uh, acquire information, let's say. And if there's no social effect, you would get the dark purple line, the diagonal effect. So you target 100% of the people, 50% respond. You target 60% of the people, 30% respond, and so on. But of course, that's not what we expect. We expect some social effect, which is characterized by the sigmoidal curve shown in light purple. But at low targeting fractions, we expect that people will not adopt because none of their friends have adopted. So the social effect suppresses adoption until you reach a critical threshold when you have explosive growth in adoption. And now the social effect that previously worked against you works for you. The threshold for an individual adopting an intervention is lower in that individual because the people around them have already adopted. Our question was, could we shift this curve our questions were several. One was, could we document this type of uh, curve experimentally? Yes, we could. And second, could we shift the curve to the left, get an enhanced social effect using the friendship nomination technique? Maybe targeting 20% of the people in a village, if those people were carefully chosen, 
could be as effective as targeting 100%. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. These are curves for one illustrative outcome, the acquisition of knowledge that respiratory illnesses are prevented by hand washing. The x-axis is the target dosage in the village as before, and the y-axis is the net change in the outcome compared to the baseline rate over a two-year period. The purple dots and lines show the impact of increasing the fraction of targeted individuals on a change in the response from baseline. So increasing, to what extent does targeting more and more people increase the desired outcome? And the orange dots and lines show the response under nomination targeting. And that line is shifted up and to the left as predicted. Again, friendship nomination is a scalable technique that doesn't require network mapping or extensive questions, which is one reason that we chose it. And we've also experimented with other similar algorithms that may be even easier to implement and that may also work by enhancing not just the response to treatment among the untreated, but response to treatment among the treated themselves. A problem with friendship nomination as an algorithm is that it might irritate the random seeds. You can't go into a village, ask people who their friends are, and then deliver the intervention to their friends and, and not deliver anything to them. So what we thought of doing is, is pick people at random, identify who their friends are, and then pick one of those friends at random and treat that pair of individuals in what we call the pair targeting technique. Uh, and we postulated that it might shift the curve even further to the left, or at least match the yellow curve as shown here. So this, this image is as before, but we added the red curve. And the question is, maybe we'll get even more bang for the buck shifting the curve, or at least we'll be on top of the orange curve, which would be great because this is an easier and more acceptable algorithm. And we evaluated this in a paper that was published in 2022 in Mumbai, India. We had 50 chawls. These are relatively poor residential units. We had uh, 2,491 women household heads. We mapped the networks in each of the chawls among these women, and we had a three by two fractional factorial design with two seed percentages, zero or 20%, and three targeting methods, random, friendship nomination, and pair targeting. These individuals got a two month anemia education intervention, and we had two outcomes that we measured. And we offered education and coupons regarding iron fortified salt to prevent anemia. And this, this slide illustrates some of our results, and the strategy actually worked to optimize social contagion. These are three illustrative social networks for three chawls assigned to different targeting algorithms. The hexagonal nodes indicate participants that were targeted to receive the intervention. The blue perimeter indicates random seeds that form the basis for choosing the targets. And the purple color indicates adoption using the metric of purchase of iron fortified salt, whether that person in that chawl was initially targeted or not. And if you look at the bottom, the numbers at the bottom, the chawl size is roughly the same across all three chawls, 61, 66, or 59. The number of targets, which was randomly done, is roughly similar, 12 targets, 13 targets, or eight targets. But the number of adopters in the chawls was very different. In the random targeting in this chawl, there were seven adopters. In the friendship nomination, there were more, as before, 12 adopters. And in the pair targeting, 21 people adopted. Much more adoption because of social contagion in this uh, situation. Let me conclude. Collective phenomena often depend on social contagion. And these insights are being widely applied. Here are just a few illustrative studies with very diverse welfare outcomes, from knowledge to voting to emotions to technology adoption, crucially involving large samples and mapped networks. Some of these are experiments with targets chosen strictly exogenously in randomized control designs. Networks matter. They can affect the exposure to germs, the experience of kindness, the gaining of weight, the likelihood of smoking, the accumulation of wealth, and much more. And understanding social contagion in complex networks can shed light on a range of important topics in the social sciences, including the diffusion of information, the diffusion of innovation, 
or the diffusion or spread of money, and also broader topics like the origins of collective action, social capital, and even individual tastes. I'd like to close with a metaphor. Consider these two objects. They are both made of carbon. And on the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First of all, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness are not properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Take the same carbon atoms and connect them one way, you get one set of properties, or connect them another way, and you get a completely different set of properties. Similarly, the nature of our connections affects the properties of our social groups. It's the ties between people that can make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties, such as cooperation and violence, wealth and poverty, health and happiness, innovation and productivity, can emerge and spread because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily solely because of the people themselves. Our experience of the world depends on the structure and function of the networks around us, near and far. Thank you very much.